This is the Mile High Five podcast with Carl Jensen and Doug Cunnington. We have authentic conversations about the journey to Phi, health, happiness, and some very odd tangents. We interview Phi experts, side hustlers, people on their way to Phi, and those who have reached the other side. Join us every week, and if you want the show notes and links and all that other stuff, head over to milehighfi.com. Hello, Jersey Shore. Welcome to the Mile High Five podcast. I'm Carl Jensen with my co-host. I'm Doug Cunnington. So, Doug, today we are interviewing Bob Haynes. Unlike most of the people we interview on Mile High Five, Bob doesn't have a blog, podcast, or anything that I know of. Maybe he's got a secret blog where he talks about us behind our backs, but I don't think so. Bob is a good, nice human. And the fact that he doesn't have any online presence doesn't make Bob any less interesting. In fact, I think it makes him more interesting. Uh, If you've been to an event like Economy, Chautauqua, or Camp Fi, you may already know Bob. In today's episode, we're going to talk about Bob's blue shirt obsession, Fi events, reconciling finances when getting married later in life, and spending for happiness. (laughs) So, so Bob, I think you're messing with me here because you saw the outline ahead of time, and I think... I've run into you like 500 times in my life, and every time I've ever seen you, Bob, you have a blue shirt on. So I put this in the outline because I want to specifically ask you about it. And you've got a red shirt on. Are are you screwing with us? And what is the story behind the blue shirts? Yeah, I think I just like primary colors. So I actually do like red shirts as well, and I I do tend to wear them maybe just a bit more at the beach. But if if this makes you a little more comfortable, Carl, (laughs) I actually have uh, one of my famous blue shirts right here. We can put that on, and uh, and now we're really ready for for the podcast (laughs) today. I actually have uh, only three of these very particular, this particular shirt. But it's funny because every time I go to buy a new blue shirt, my wife will tell me, You already have that shirt. And I'm like, no, no, no. The pattern is just slightly different in such and such a way. And uh, yeah, I don't know what it is, but it's one of the things that I tended to hold on to, I guess, from my working career, because this is this was almost like my uniform when I worked. And I don't know, I guess I liked it and just kept it as part of my identity. Do you get like the same brand every time or do you vary like Carl's a Kirkwood man? Yeah, mostly. I, I Once I found this brand, which is Joseph A. Bank, you know, it's funny. When I was working, all the dress shirts I bought were either a little, the arm length was a little too short or a little too long. And then I realized that they were kind of like, you know, size to be either a 32, 33 or a 34, 35. And my sleeve length should be exactly 34. <laughs> so once I realized that Joseph A. Bank actually carried sleeve length exactly 34 that's what i went that's what i went with and so yeah i pretty much wear almost exclusively for my button down shirts joseph a bank this is not sponsored by the way but yeah (laughs) that's funny when i used to have to you know wear business casual like those fit me really well too in fact i think the suit like the suit slash tux that i got married in is joseph a bank like it just it's pretty nice stuff now I don't wear yeah. any of it. I haven't worn a suit since uh, the last funeral I went to. So unfortunately, <laughs> do you still own a suit, Doug, for future funerals? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I double it doubles for weddings as well. Nice. So versatile. <laughs> How about um, you, Carl? Do you, do you still own a suit? I don't think so. I'm not even sure. I might have donated them all. But the one thing I've always thought of, and that's why I asked the question to Doug, like, what happens if I do have to go to a funeral? Like do you. Are funerals more casual these days? I guess I haven't been to one in a while. Can can you dress down a little bit? Like I've got nicer pants and a button down shirt that I can tuck in, or <laughs> is a suit an expectation? I think I think it depends. It depends, but I know I don't have dress shoes anymore. So this is a little dark, uh, especially for this early in the episode. But when my mom passed away, I was like, I don't have any dress shoes, and I'm like, if I can get away with wearing whatever the fuck I want, it's at my mom's own funeral, right, or my own mom's funeral. So I was like, I wore uh, like Birkenstock clogs, which were uh, fine. No one says anything to you if your immediate relative is the one <laughs> that passed away. Life hack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's get into the fi stuff, probably. Right. This yeah. Is a great yeah. transition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of death, Bob, how did you discover financial independence? I discovered financial independence. Well, I mean, I think I've known, you know, a 
vaguely about the concept uh, for for most of my life, but not not specifically about financial independence and the movement. You know, I kind of was raised uh, in an environment where you know every dollar was hard earned, and so you had to make sure that you spent it wisely. And I was taught early on by my grandmother, you know, the rule of 72 and how when you get out in the real world, you should establish yourself and then work hard to make as much money as you can. And you're allowed to spend 10% of that on yourself. And then 90% of it, you put in US savings bonds. That was her advice to me, which I I followed a bit, maybe 90%, not so much, but uh, certainly saved and invested knowing that, you know, I had this kind of somewhere off in the distance idea that maybe I would retire early, although that was like a very vague, like what's early, right? Is it 62? Is it 60? Um, And then uh, back in 2017, I was listening to the Tim Ferriss podcast and uh, I heard Mr. Money Mustache and you know, it was kind of crazy. I almost didn't listen to the episode because Tim said in the intro, we have one of the most requested guests on this podcast. So I'm like sitting on the edge of my seat, like, okay, great. This is going to be some awesome guest that I can't wait to hear. And then he says, welcome, Mr. Money Mustache. And I was like, who? Like, wh- what are we talking about here? I've never heard of this guy before. That sounds like a stupid, you know, moniker. And I almost like in disgust, like turned off the podcast. But I, I'm really glad that I didn't. I listened to that uh, in its entirety. I actually think I was on my way to work and I just sat in the parking lot listening to the rest of that show. And I immediately went to uh, his blog and read the shockingly simple math. And what I did that night was I put together our net worth statement and kind of looked at our spending. And crazily enough, we had accidentally reached financial independence, not realizing you know, what the 4% rule was or anything like that. And uh, it just kind of blew my mind. So being all excited about it, I went and grabbed my wife and I said, uh, you know, hey, look, we're actually financially independent and we can retire early. So, you know, let's quit our jobs. And she's like, well, I love my job. Why would I want to quit my job? So I was like, ah, okay, I guess we're not going to do this now. I'll put the spreadsheet away. (laughs) So yeah, it was kind of crazy just accidentally realizing that, that we had, we had hit the number. I have a few follow-up questions. So how old were you when your grandmother told you about the rule of 72? Ooh. Roughly. Yeah, I was, I'm sure I was a teenager, you know, probably 13, 14, something like that. Okay. And then, I mean, did you, did you get it? Not just conceptually, cause I'm sure you were like, oh, whatever. But were you like, oh, I can see how this is so powerful over a long period of time and all that. Yeah, I think the I think, you know, mathematically I would play around with the numbers on the calculator, right? And be like, "Oh, wow, this is this is really cool." If you at, at the time I'm like, "Well, yeah, but you really need a lot of money to start, right? Cuz it's like it doesn't the numbers don't get big, you know, until you're very far down the line." And I guess that's where she, you know, kind of realized that she had to hit me with that whole, "Yeah, well, you get out in life and establish yourself and then start saving giant chunks of every single raise and you'll get to those big numbers and that's where the rule of 72 will, or, will really start to to pay off for you." You know, the other thing that she showed me was like she just walked around the house and she said like, "You know, your grandfather and I when we bought this house, we didn't like immediately go and furnish the entire thing. We saved up in cash for every single piece of furniture and bought them one at a time. So she also kind of cautioned me at the time that, you know, don't use debt, use your savings to actually live within your means as you're growing your wealth over time. So yeah, I don't think I got it, got it. And certainly didn't, I didn't, exactly stay on the path that she kind of laid out for me. But I guess I didn't stray too far enough from the path to make the ideas that she talked about not work. And then the other follow-up, and then I'll let Carl ask his follow-ups too. So you said in 2017, after you heard Mr. Money Mustache on Tim Ferriss, that you realized that you hit Phi. So you were rough, roughly working for about 20 years or so, not to give away your age, but yeah, roughly about 20 years or so. Yeah. Were you investing in like pre-tax, post-tax and like a Roth to have like a nice sort of um, 
nice access, easy access to various accounts? Did you do real estate? Can you talk about your portfolio at the time? Sure. So I think we had, uh, my wife and I had kind of always had the um, idea that we should be, you know, fully maximizing, you know, our contributions to our 401k. And then, you know, with the savings rate that we had, money would kind of pile up in our, you know, brokerage and or savings accounts. I mean, I'm ashamed to say that actually, when I found uh, Mr. Money Mustache, I had we we had over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in cash because I was kind of concerned about where the market was, and I hadn't yet heard of JL Collins and the Simple Path to Wealth. And uh, you know, now of course I've learned that it's time in the market, not timing the market. But at the time, I had you know I was almost like trying it different advisors on. So I had, you know, multiple robo advisors. I had an actual, you know, certified financial planner also managing a chunk of money. And I was almost running like a horse race between like, you know, four or five different, who's going to get me the best returns. And also using my, uh, idiotic, like, you know, time the market strategy, I feel like the market's high. Therefore, you know, I'm going to save this money up till the next crash, which of course now I know is completely ridiculous. So it didn't take long after I found Pete's blog for me to find all the other resources and kind of go down the rabbit hole like a lot of folks do when they find this community. And, you know, reading JL Collins's book, The Simple Path to Wealth, really it was a huge, you know, mind shift for me in that it's like, you know what, I don't have to run all these horse races. I really only need two funds over time and I shouldn't have all this money on the sideline. So we made the decision then and there, that was sometime in early 2017 that we were going to, you know, just go with a simple two fund portfolio and instantly made those changes in the retirement accounts. I'm actually still in the process of unwinding some of those individual stocks and other mutual funds in my taxable brokerage account, just because we don't want the tax hit all in one year. I think right now, the last time I looked, I think we have maybe $225,000 worth of long-term capital gains to finish unwinding in things that we say that we don't want to own, but you know, we'll get there over time. I hope I answered your question, Doug, because I feel like I was rambling a bit there. No, that was great. So, Bob, I see a lot of similarities in your story to mine. My maternal grandmother was also a child of the Depression, and she would also buy us saving bonds and tell us to buy them for ourselves. But my most, the memory that really sticks out to me is every time I saw her, we'd go over to her house. She might give us like a dollar or two for trimming the hedges or whatever, and she would scowl at my sister and I, just get this like mean face and say, save your money, just like that. And that's it. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. she was kind of scary. I'm like, holy shit. And I was like half scared, half laughing, but I think it sunk in because I saved and saved and saved. But maybe similar to your story, Bob, I didn't know what I was saving for. So when I discovered Phi, it just put something I could do with all this money. And it's so strange to consider now we just had this big pile of money. We're saving, saving, saving. And I'm not sure what I would have done if we didn't discover like Mr. Money Mustache and these people who said, oh, you don't have to work till you're 62. You can do it now. It seems pretty silly that that thought would never come to me without some external influence. But I think that's actually might have what happened. Bob, do you think you, what do you think would have happened to you if you wouldn't have discovered Mr. Money Mustache via this Tim Ferriss? podcast? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question thinking about the counterfactual and what might have happened. Yeah. I wonder with all the press that I feel like the FI movement has gotten, you know, over the last seven years, if I maybe would have discovered it a different way, but, you know, unfortunately it would have been probably, you know, multiple years later. And so, you know, it wouldn't, it would have delayed my trajectory to kind of being early retired and living the life that, you know, my wife and I love today. I would hope that I would have discovered it by now, but who knows, right? It's it's totally possible that, you know, we would still keep working and, you know, kind of blissfully thinking that, you know, yes, yeah, someday, hopefully we have enough to retire. You know, I think what, what did Susie Orman say? Like you need at least $10 million to retire. So we would just be like slaving away to try to get to that $10 million number, maybe, I don't know. That's a, that's a really good question, Carl. I would hope that it would be that I found 
identify some other way, but it's possible without knowing about this path, I could still be working. What do you, what do you guys think? I mean, if, if you hadn't found the community. For me, actually, I'm, I want to come back to your statement before I answer, but it's interesting because the fire movement did get a lot of coverage, but the messenger is important because of the context. So like coming through Tim Ferriss, who was open-minded and wanted to learn what Pete was doing and his outlook on life and all, all that kind of stuff, right? Lifestyle stuff versus like a CNBC article where maybe they frame it in a way where it's like ultra frugal and Bob, I know you, we've been roommates a couple of times at economy and you know, you and I, we're not super frugal, right? Like we'll spend some money. You're a car guy. And like, if you get the message of like, you can't spend money, you would have instantly been turned off, right? Like you would not be like signing up for that, but there's a wide range. Of course, for me, I think <laughs> I was like, if I didn't discover the the fire movement, I was already getting involved in like the other side of the coin of entrepreneurship and side hustles. So I was already moving in that direction. So I had a bad attitude about work and corporations, and I was very positive about self-employment and working for yourself. So I would have found the path that I'm on anyway, and maybe maybe I would have kept working longer, but at least it was on my own stuff that I was interested in, which doesn't feel as bad as working for someone else where you have to listen to someone make bad decisions and then follow, follow their, follow their orders and all that stuff. So I think I would have been okay. However, my wife, she has two days of work left right now or one and a half or something like that. That's um, awesome. Thank you. And yeah, like that would have taken, I mean, it already took a little bit longer than I would have hoped for her to feel comfortable to stop working. She'll be in an upcoming episode, by the way. And for her to get comfortable, we needed to be like in Phi Central here in Longmont and have all these great examples and then work with an advisor. Like she needed a lot more reassurance than I did. So she potentially could have kept working for another like 15 years or so when we could have stopped like four years ago, basically. So, all right. I talked a long time. Carl, what about you? No, all this is super interesting. I was kind of brought up to really value a job, like especially by my dad. His whole identity was wrapped around being an electrician and he was just obsessed with that. And I think that kind of sunk into me too. So the truth is, I think I needed an example. I'm not sure what would have happened. I think I just would have kept on working and just... Um, done what I thought society expected of me. I never knew anyone who actually stopped working before they were in their 60s. So I think I would have continued doing that until I had an example. Even if I would have done the numbers, I'm not sure it would have occurred to me to retire early. And I'm not sure why not. It's obvious. It's a simple math problem. So why not? But it just seems so different. Maybe that's why a lot of people can't grasp it or they don't think it's the awesome thing that we think it is when you tell them. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm just a little bit farther along that spectrum than other people. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it's like the context, right? It's the framing because if you're just thinking like work, you earn money, like maybe you don't know how much you need to have, but it's like 10 million or something beyond what you think or advisors are like, well, you should save, what did they used to say? It's like your maximum income at the end of your career, you need 70% of that, which would be crazy. Like that'd be like, what are hundreds of thousands of dollars or something like that, right? By the time we potentially would have stopped working. I don't know. So once you frame it differently, it's like, oh yeah, obviously you stop working. Like most people hate their jobs, but I don't know, Bob, how'd you feel about your job? Were you like, this sucks. I got to get out of here. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting when you think of you know, your whole career and, you know, what I'm, I'm sure much like anybody out there, there are jobs that you like more than others. Um, and there were certainly times in my career where I really loved what I was doing and I loved the people I was working with. At the very end of my career, I was feeling quite burnt out. And, you know, I think it's, uh, it's one of those things, even when I really loved my job, I still kind of liked what I did on the weekends better than what I was doing at my job. So, you know, being out on the boat fishing with my dad or traveling with my wife were always kind of better than, you know, working. So, yeah, it's, uh, I think that's something that's, 
interesting to think about too. Had I found, you know, back to Carl's original question, had I found the FI movement in, I was, if I was in a place where I was really loving my job, who knows if I had, you know, maybe I, I mean, my wife wanted me to put the spreadsheet away because she wasn't ready to quit. But if I was also similarly thinking, well, that's nice that I can retire, but why would I? Because I'm really loving what I'm doing. You know, I think it was being, you know, in the certain time in my life where I was ready to hear this message that I could, and maybe not even retire forever, but just to take a long break or a sabbatical or, or a mini retirement was a message that was really resounding to me when I was feeling as burnt out as I was at my job. Cool. Bob, let's talk about five events. And I have a really embarrassing confession that, I, that I've that i never told you about before. I, <laughs> Doug hasn't heard this either. So we both went to the UK Chautauqua in 2019. That was the old JL Collins event that no longer goes on. But I was standing there in the lobby and you came up to me You're like, hey, Carl, how's it going? And in my mind, I'm like, who, who is this guy? We, we must have met somewhere. Like he knows me from something, but... I have no recollection of who this person is. So I just went along with it. I'm like, hey, how's it going? And then I, I paid attention to other people and eventually I learned your name. So I acted like I had remembered you, but I had no clue. Where did we first meet, Bob? It must have been <laughs> at a five event prior to that. That's funny. Yeah. Um, we first met, you and I first met at the first FI event that I ever went to, which was when I learned about Camp FI, um, I immediately said, oh, this sounds like something you know I want to go to. So I went to the website to sign up and there had there was one in the mid-Atlantic, which was close to me, but it was already sold out. So on the schedule, the next available one was the Midwest just north of Minneapolis. So that would have been Labor Day weekend of 2018. And uh, yeah, I that's where I met you. That's where I met JL and Jane Collins. Coach Carson was there. Gwen from Fiery Millennials. I mean, there were so many people that like these people that I had been reading their blogs or listening to their podcasts. And it was like, oh my gosh, I get to meet these people in person. And at that event, Carl, you actually said something very impactful to me it was probably the, the biggest takeaway that I got from the whole weekend. And I got a lot of really good takeaways from that weekend. You had said to me when we were talking, you know, very one-on-one, -on -one, very frankly about, you know, our finances and, you know, early retirement and being burnt out and all of this. And you said to me, you know, in, in the midst of me going through kind of this one more year syndrome, my even though it was my idea, my wife had already left her job, but I was still working, which was kind of crazy. <laughs> you, you said to me, Bob, everybody worries about running out of money, no matter how much you have, everybody has that worry, but almost nobody worries about running out of life and you're guaranteed to run out of life. So do you think you could go back to work if you left your job for you know a mini retirement or a sabbatical? And I, and I said, yeah, of course. And you're like, well, well, there you go. Why not at least take a break if, if you don't want to say that you're retiring forever? And that was probably my biggest takeaway from that event, Carl, was that little bit of advice that you gave me in a you know 10 minute conversation one on one. So thank you. Cool. You're welcome. <laughs> You've been, uh, where, where did you make up that quote from? Or like, did you hear something that made you, that inspired you to say that? No, that was all my own. Yeah, if I heard it from something, I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure I came up with that myself. I just, th there's a certain blog that I don't want to mention, but so many people are focused on running out of money. I'm like, dude, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Like you probably won't run out of that, but <laughs> death is a much, should be a much bigger concern for y'all. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it's a great quote, Carl, and I, I don't hand out compliments to you often, so I want you to really... <laughs> Now that, that is an awesome one. And I've heard a lot of people say it back to you and I don't even, I don't know what blog you're talking about, but like, there's a lot of blogs where it's like deep, super analysis about like, it doesn't matter. Like these are just projections anyway. And it's like deep diving on the 4% rule versus like 3.75. It's like wrong part. You guys are focusing on the wrong part. Like people enjoy it, but I, I don't think it's effective use of time. Yeah, I completely agree. It's all... It, the market may or may not return above 4%. It probably will, but the past is not representative of the future. So it's silly to spend any more than five minutes thinking about all this stuff, I think. 
And Bob, any thoughts on that? We're not going to force you to have an opinion on if people are wasting their time on blogs <laughs> comparing and analyzing the 4% rule, but how, how deep did you get into it? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's obviously an endless source of debate and uh, discussion in the community. I think I agree with, you know, what you guys are saying. I mean, in addition to, you know, it's it's funny because it's in every investment that you go to buy, right? Past performance does not equal future results. So yeah, that's great that the Trinity study says this or that, or that's great that other bloggers maybe can do some other analysis based on other factors that weren't taken into effect. And we come out with a, with a somewhat different number. I think that from a personality perspective, anybody that has done the hard work, whether you know, inadvertently not realizing they were on the path to FI or, you know, very intentionally putting in the hard work to get to FI, you're not going to just, you know, abide by some kind of mathematical rule of whether it's 4.23% or 3.19% and just do that every year. If the stock market goes down by 50, 60 or 70% one year, you're going to figure it out. You were smart enough to get to FI. Therefore, you'll figure out what to do um, if your portfolio takes a big hit. And likely, that's not the only problem. You know, if the, if the market's down by 70 or 80 percent, something else is going on and you're probably going to want to have a bunker with, you know, water and <laughs> ammo. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, it's, that's the bottom line. So, yeah, we, I think the community spends too much time on it, but I think you don't realize it until you're kind of a while down the road. And it's like, you know what, you'll figure it out. It, you know, you, we haven't, my wife and I haven't set, you know, a certain percentage that we just modify by the CPI every year and take it out. We spend what we'd like and just make sure that we check in on the portfolio and, and everything looks good. And how long have you guys been not working? So Amy left in 2018 and then I, I followed her about a year later in 2019. So I'm coming up on my five year anniversary in May, Memorial Day weekend of not having any kind of full-time job. Very cool. And we'll, we'll switch back to some of the events because I met you, I think in Austin. Is that the first time we met? I think so. Yeah. At the, at the FinCon. Yeah. So we're FinCon a few years ago. That was my, um, one of the first five events that I went to. Yeah. And we actually bonded over the Tim Ferriss interview that you referenced before. You've been to a ton of events and you keep going back. So do any of them stand out particularly aside from the, the one where you met Carl for the first time? Yeah, I think that that event kind of kicked things off for me. And uh, Carl, you, you may or may not remember this conversation as well. You asked me about going to FinCon that year, which was only about three weeks after that Camp Fi ended. And I said to you, well, it sounds like it's mainly for content creators. And, you know, I'm not, I'm probably not doing anything, you know, in the content creation space. And you said, yeah, but do you like beer? And I said, yeah, of course I like beer. I think we were each holding a can of beer at the time. And I said, yeah. And you're like, well, I have this really cool beer tasting party. And um, you know, you're invited if you go to FinCon. And that's pretty much all it took. I was like, all right, well, I guess I might as, <laughs> I guess I might as well go to FinCon. I actually looked at the calendar and it was kind of fortuitous. My wife and I were actually coming in on a cruise into Port Canaveral. And I think that year it was in Orlando. So literally 40 minutes away from the, the venue, we were coming into a cruise just a few days earlier. So I'm like, oh, I'll just take a few extra days off work and stay here for FinCon. And um, with as many people that I had met, you know, at the, at the Camp Fi, I got to reconnect with Carl and, and many of the folks that I'd met there and then meet some other folks in the community. And it kind of got me hooked on, uh, on going to events. Those, those first two within three weeks of each other were pretty pivotal. And now I think for the FI community, it's, um, the economy conference has almost taken over the place that FinCon held for like the FI and fire folks, at least in my mind, I don't know what you guys think, but I've really been kind of leaning towards going to economy as my like definitely need to go every year event versus going to FinCon as somebody that doesn't create content or have any sort of, you know, online commercial presence. Quick plug for economy then. Are you going next year in 2025? Yes. All right. Yeah, I have my yeah. ticket too. Are you? You, you got it, Carl? Uh, yes. Got yeah. it. Yeah. 
So, so yeah, people sign up. I think it's over half full at the time that we're recording this. So I, I haven't been to as many uh, FinCons as you, I don't think, Bob, but um, I feel like you might be right. I mean, there is definitely a FI space, but the, the FinCon audience and attendees is definitely a much wider financial set of people. But Carl, you've been to a lot of them. So has it shifted to economy now? I would say so. FinCon used to even have a thing where people like Bob, who don't have an online commercial presence, as Bob said, could go and just attend as someone who wanted to meet the creators. And it seemed pretty popular. Uh, I think probably at least 20% of the people were there on that ticket. And then I think they discontinued it. I don't think they have it anymore. But yeah, economy is the place to be if you want to just hang out with people. And uh, because FinCon, they'll have things on how to monetize your blog or how to boost your podcast. And most people don't care about that. So yes, economy is the thing to do. If you want a smaller version, the Camp Fies are great. We'll put links to all these in the show notes. And there's other events too. Amberly is going to have a Fi cruise at the end of January. And she had it already, but she's going to have another one. So that's amberlygrant.com slash cruise. And then there's Amy Minkley's event in Bali. So there's many, many events you could choose from. So if you want a big event with a lot of people, high energy, economy would be the thing to do. If you want something smaller, a Camp Fi or maybe Amy's thing or Amberly's cruise. Mm -hmm. We're just plugging a bunch of stuff. Uh, I think Jess and Corey from Pioneers, they have one sort of a small retreat type thing. I don't know the details on that one, but I think it's in, is it New Hampshire or something like that? You guys remember? Yeah, it's East Coast somewhere. Okay. Yeah, so there's options for for all sorts of people. Well, Bob, what's your favorite part of the events? I know they're all a little bit different, but what keeps you coming back over the years? I think the the biggest thing is, you know, reconnecting with old friends and making new ones. And it's the spaces in between the actual events that, our plan. So the speakers are great. And, you know, being able to attend something that uh, you, you get to learn, you know, keep learning is, is awesome. But I really like, you know, kind of the times away where it's just, you know, maybe a handful of folks that you grab lunch with or go have a coffee or something. And, you know, just connecting on a deeper level with people that are kind of, you know, walking the same path as you, maybe they're further ahead and you can learn from them, or maybe they're, you know, a few steps behind and you can help somebody else. I think that's one of the things that uh, is so great about these events is for, I think for many people, the, the concepts of financial independence and early retirement are just so foreign from you know most people's day to day that it's uncomfortable to have conversations that that touch on these topics in our regular day to day lives. So going to these events allows us to connect with folks where it's easy. We already know we have you know this much in common, and um, I think it just it makes it easier to for like an intro- introvert like me to go and actually you know have conversations with cool people. It's funny. You're like, I'm an introvert like me. We're roommates, so I know you came in pretty late. You have a you have a blast, man. You don't seem like an introvert. Yeah, I think I learned to play <laughs> the uh, I think I learned to play the extrovert in my job. So the last 20 years or so of my career, 15 years or so of my career, I worked as a sales engineer or a solutions architect. So um, I effectively, you know, was part of a sales team. I kind of helped account managers, you know, close large enterprise hardware and software deals like data center infrastructure deals. And as part of that job, I think I learned to kind of make myself act like uh, an extrovert when I could, but it definitely, um, it definitely, I feel like it, it drains me over time. So I, I need to kind of, I think just like you, Doug, you know, every once in a while, sneak away and just take some time for myself just to kind of recharge because I'm really playing the extrovert, not just naturally extroverted. Yeah. I sneak away and take a nap like every single day. Nice. You don't feel so introverted when you're with that group, I feel. though. Like I would call myself an introvert too, but I don't feel like that. Like when I'm at the grocery store, I'm never going to launch into a conversation with a stranger, but I would totally do that at economy and it feels I agree. normal. Yeah, I totally agree. 
So are you going to any other events? Uh, I know you said you're going to economy in 2025, and we have something lined up, you and I, Bob, with a bunch of other people, Germany. Are you going to any other mainstream events in 2025 or 2024? Well, yeah, I have another 2025 event in January. I'm going to go to the Camp Fi Southeast in Florida. I've been going. So the one kind of success story, if you can call it, I know that it seems like I've, I've one of the common frustrations for a lot of folks that I, I've met in this community is that, yeah, you know, they've had minimal impact or they feel like they've had little impact on those around them to try to like say, Hey, we found this great thing. You can buy back your time and do whatever you want with your, with your life. And yet the people that, you know, are in our lives often don't really want to hear the message. So a buddy of mine, my buddy Sid is kind of the only like real world guy that has actually, you know, kind of taken the bull by the horns and, you know, gotten if not on the Phi path, much closer to the Phi path and certainly changed the tra trajectory of his financial life. And uh, he's been going with me to that, uh, that Florida event for the past two years now. So I'm going to go back to that with him, which will be cool. And that's relatively local. He's, he lives in Orlando, so it's relatively local for him. I don't have any other um, events on the calendar for this year, but I might you know, kind of grab a ticket to the Midwest where you and I met back in 2018, Carl, pending, you know, scheduling conflicts. We live at the beach. So my wife and I host a lot of folks that, that come through and, you know, Labor Day weekend at the beach in, in uh, New Jersey is a pretty popular time. So if I can break away, I might do that. And you mentioned the Amberley cruise. I would love to do that next year if, uh, if we can make that work from a scheduling perspective. All right. We have a sponsor this week and that's Ghost Bed. And actually Rich, the I guess uh, he's a marketing director. I don't know his title over there, but he's a listener of the show. He went to Economy. So we got to hang out and party all weekend long. It was really fun. And we appreciate the support from Ghost Bed. And in fact, Carl and Mindy, they got a uh, new mattress. So why don't you tell us a little about it? Yeah, we ordered the Ghost Bed Classic. This will be in our guest area. It comes in this big, heavy box. It is substantial. You open the box, uh, you cut the thing open, and it expands and turns into a mattress. It's kind of like those, uh, do you remember the capsules when you were a kid? You drop in water, then it turns into a big foam dinosaur. That's what yeah. the mattress is kind of like. We have not sleep tested it yet, but we... Uh, we laid on it and gave it a, a little bit of a test. Wow, that doesn't sound... Uh, mm. <laughs> it was a, a very PG test. We laid on it and had a conversation. And it feels really nice. So we'll give it a sleep test ride shortly. Very good. And did it feel... So one of the things that we always talk about is like if it feels cool or not and uh, just that we're hot sleepers. So did you get any sense of the heat or cooling technology? Yeah, so far it feels cool. The real test will be me sleeping on it throughout the night. I usually heat up as the night goes on. So if I don't wake up at 2 in the morning covered in sweat, that will be the true test. So I'll report back in a couple of weeks how that went. All right, very good. Well, people can check out GhostBed and just note, it's a family-owned business with 20-plus years of experience. They have over 60,000 five-star reviews. And they're made in the U.S. with premium materials. You also get a 101-night at-home sleep trial. So, Carl, you guys could check it out. Test it out 101 times or more. I don't know. I don't know how often you guys could test it out, but you got 101 days, and it's a 20-year warranty. Nice. And if you use our special link, ghostbed.com slash milehighfi with code milehighfi at checkout, You'll get an unbelievable 50% off site-wide. So on everything, they also have sheets, pillows, and a lot of other stuff besides mattresses. Yeah, we may check out some of the sheets. Eh? Rich was uh, really plugging. You got to have the full you know, experience overall. And we got the pillow already. You guys got the mattress. What are you smirking about, Carl? Yeah. Are you going to say something inappropriate? <laughs> I'm thinking something inappropriate, <laughs> but I'll stop there. All right, cool. Well, let's let's keep rolling here and let's let's talk about marriage. So, you got married sort of later in life and you and your partner already had money. You were established adults with your own financial patterns. So, how did you sort all that out? 
Yeah, I think uh, that's a good, that's a really good question, Doug, because obviously I think the statistics are out there that of the 50% of marriages that end in divorce, a big reason for that is disagreements about money. So it was uh, very cool. We actually got married in the Catholic church and they make you take a class called pre-Cana. And it's kind of this weekend event where you get together and you talk about things that maybe a lot of people don't talk about before they get married, but they probably should. I got to be honest, I was not looking forward to going to this class at all, (laughs) Um, but actually it ended up being pretty good. So basically they would talk, you know, somebody would talk, the facilitator would talk about a particular topic and then they would give us kind of a a little quiz to do around things in that topic. And these aren't like, you know, um, uh, you know, right and wrong answers. There's, there's no right and wrong answer. It's just, you know, what your thoughts about, you know, finances or kids or, you know, in-laws, you know, and, and how you feel. And so they would have the men go off one way and the women go off the other way. And you kind of independently fill out your quiz about that particular topic. And then you kind of come back together And, you know, my wife was actually concerned because she's like, oh, we're going to be like the oldest people in this class. And then, you know, everybody's going to be looking at us and this, that. And, uh, you know, it's just funny because we went through this class and we're answering these questions independently. And then we're coming back together and we're reviewing them. And for a lot of these questionnaires, my wife and I are pretty much putting the same answers, basically saying that we're on the same page and finances was, was one of them. So the cool thing about Amy and I, as I kind of describe it is that we, when we met, we were both independently on our own, like five journeys, but just independently like running parallel. So when we got together, actually, when we got married, my wife, was a strong earner. I was like a really strong earner. And, um, but I wasted a lot more money. So our net worth differences were, was almost nothing. It was like literally like $20,000 between our net worths, even though we were super financially successful. So it kind of uh, made it pretty easy for us to go into the marriage saying like, Hey, we're both coming in with effectively the same thing. And we're both going to be pulling in the same direction. Little did we know that it was just going to be one year after that, that I would hear Mr. Money Mustache on Tim Ferriss. And I say to my wife all the time now, like, can you believe that like she left her job within two years of us getting married and I left within three years of us getting married, which just kind of blows our mind that we've actually spent more of our marriage now as retired people in our forties than, uh, than we did, you know, earlier. It's just, it just really is mind blowing. Mm. And how old were you when you got married and how long had you been together before that? Yeah, we dated for 10 years before we got engaged and we got married, let's see, in 2016. So eight years ago. Yeah, I was 41 and Amy was 40. Okay. So. And then the, the other part, I think we manage our money fairly similarly with our partners. So how do you guys manage like the checking accounts, credit cards, like other savings, retirement accounts? Because everything was separate um, as you were coming in. And a lot of people like Carl, you guys got married when you were in your 20s, right? Like a little younger. Yeah, late 20s. So and you guys kind of combined everything, right? Yes, You, you did. Okay, so yeah, Bob, what do you guys do? Yeah, so I think that you're right, Doug. We had obviously by that time strong financial habits that, you know, we did our own thing and we were kind of operationalizing our own independent FI journeys. And so when it comes to merging our finances together, well, we have completely merged in terms of we've titled, you know, all of our accounts so that each other has, you know, we're like everything's joint 50 50, which, uh, when we got our will done, that was at the recommendation of the lawyer to to go ahead and do that if that made sense, which to us, it made perfect sense. And we still maintain individual checking accounts that like have us as the primary name. So because, you know, I have my credit cards, Amy has her credit cards. So what we did was we basically built kind of a joint checking account that's for both of us. And as I am reallocating 
which I, I consider our drawdown strategy and allocation strategy as it's like a, a mental trick here for me to not feel like I'm drawing down. It actually feels like I'm just reallocating. So when I reallocate some of our um, money into cash, I put all the cash in our joint checking account. And then Amy and I just take money from the joint checking account. She pays her credit cards and the bills that she normally pays. I pay my credit cards and the bills that I normally pay. And it works out well because we we maintain, you know, a joint account, but then we have like individual autonomy with our own personal accounts. So works out well. For let's say you want to splurge and get something maybe a little more expensive. Is there a dollar amount where you guys have determined that you will discuss it versus just automatically just like, hey, I want this thing, I'm gonna buy it. Yeah, we've discussed that over the years. You know, it's funny. Old habits die hard. I mean, honestly, it's ridiculous. I, I'm, I feel embarrassed even kind of like telling you this, but like there'll be times where I'm looking at like two or three things on Amazon and like one's $11 and one's $13 and one's $15. And it's like, well, which one has the most stars and which one? And Amy's like, just buy it. Like, what are you doing? Like, you know, quibbling about two or four dollars. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, just pull the trigger on, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. I think that we will generally, Amy and I run, you know, even trivial things like whatever this mythical, you know, 10 or $15 item is, uh, by each other only mainly just because of proximity. You know, we live in the same house. We don't, don't have jobs. So we're around each other a lot, but certainly I would never make a, a, a very large purchase without, you know, discussing it with her. And that would probably be, you know, anything over maybe say $500. Like I would feel comfortable if I was out, you know, say with my dad and I found a great deal on something that I've been looking for for forever. And it was like 300 bucks. It's like, no problem. I'll buy that. But if something's over say 500, I think I'd, I'd discuss it with my wife. We recently pulled the trigger on, um, some folding e-bikes. So I think last year you guys probably remember at economy, Kevin Ha oh, yeah. kind of gave his entire you know presentation w- was on why you should ride an e-bike. And uh, it just reminded me being out there with you guys and then riding the electric scooter to your opening party. Like, how come it's been a year? I've been thinking about getting an e-bike for forever. I've talked to Kevin Ha. Actually, I met him, Carl, at that same Camp Fi 2018 with you. I've talked about getting, you know, e-bikes forever and still haven't done it. And there's no reason other than, you know, I just overanalyze everything, which bike is better than which and which is best bang for the buck and all this kind of nonsense. And Kevin told me last year, is this a similar, but not as impactful as advice as you gave me in 2018, Carl? Uh, Kevin said, Bob, don't w- just get whatever, whatever bike is on the top of your list right now, just buy it. Cause if you get into e-bikes, like I get in, like I got into e-bikes, you're going to have six or seven e-bikes, you know, within a couple few years. So it doesn't matter which one you start with. You just got to start, you got to get your first e-bike. So we just pulled the trigger on a couple of electric, electric XP 3.0 long range folding e-bikes. And my wife and I are planning all the places that we're going to take the bikes to and actually ride around as a, as a mechanism for it, you know, doing little mini adventures, both in New Jersey here and then further afield on our road trips. Okay. And I was about to ask, so folding because you will be traveling with it in your, in your car. Yes. Got yeah. It. That was okay. the idea. Okay. Maybe I'll get a recommendation from you. See the, the good part is I have friends that do a ton of research. So I could just say, Hey Bob, you spent whatever, a uh, week researching this. <laughs> Just tell me which one you decided on. Good enough for me. Gotcha. It's because you're smart, Doug. <laughs> Thanks. Thank <you>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, e-bikes are great. I'm super glad you bought one. I didn't know, I didn't realize you could have seven or eight of them like... Uh, Mr. Ha said, I guess I just have one, but I've, I always lust after other ones. So now I guess I have permission from you and him to buy more. Yeah. Kevin says buy another e-bike. Yeah. Nice. Then when you have friends over, they could borrow them. It's like guitars, right? You could buy like 10. I could only play one at a time, but why not have a lot of them? Sure. Bob, do you ever disagree on any money issues with your partner? Huh. Do we ever disagree? I mean, I'm certain that we do. However, I'm struggling to come up with an example. Um, You know, I I guess, yeah, right now there's actually, 
I, I wouldn't disagreement's probably even a strong word. Um, <laughs> talk about, you know, to, just to take a giant step back. I, I know that like talk about first world problems. I almost feel embarrassed, like talking about, you know, some of the things that we talk about in this community, it's like, you know, get out your world's biggest, you know, world's smallest violin and play me a tune. <laughs> right. Because like, yeah. it, you know, we have it so bad. So, you know, Amy and I, for whatever silly reason, even though there's just two of, two of us, we currently have three vehicles. Amy's primary driver is a, a 2008 Acura MDX. And it's over the last couple of years had some maintenance issues and it's gotten to the point where, I mean, it's running fine and we have no issues with it day to day, but if we ever talk about taking long road trips, it's a car, it's a vehicle that my wife doesn't feel comfortable, you know, driving to Florida in, for example. So my point to her is like, Hey, you've kind of got the oldest daily driver in the fleet. Let's get you a new car. I mean, there's, I mean, it's not a matter of if we will ever buy my wife a new car. It's just when we buy her a new car. And if you're not comfortable, you know, taking this thing on a road trip, we should get something that you're comfortable with, whether it's a brand new car or something three years old off lease, which is what we typically buy. Let's go ahead and do that. But my wife is kind of like, Hey, I don't, you know, we have three cars, you know, 99.99% of the time, they're all sitting in the driveway doing nothing. There's no reason to go and spend money on a new car right now. So I don't necessarily disagree with her take, but again, it's one of those things of it's not if we will ever get her a new car, it's just when, and no time like today or the present to go get my wife a new car, but she's pushing back. And so who knows, maybe that'll be a two or three year from now thing that we do. I'm not sure. Again, first world problem. Sure. <laughs> So, Bob, I think that's a super good segue because I've always thought you were a little bit different in that you didn't embrace the severe frugality that many of us, including me, have embraced in the past in the FI community. You've always had nicer cars. How do you feel about that, I guess? I'm not even sure what the question is here, but um, yeah, how, how do you feel about the FI community and spending on stuff that might be important to you in cars? Yeah, that's a, yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question in this community and to tie it back in a little bit with, you know, what Doug said earlier about, you know, the framing and the context matters. I can, uh, just a, a little bit of an aside conversation, the very first choose FI local group meetup that we went to in Philadelphia, um, I was super excited to go. My wife was a bit hesitant, but I'm like, nah, come on, you know, we'll check it out. It should be cool. And it was an inaugural event. It was the first time the, the Philadelphia group was getting together. So nobody knew each other. Like it was, everybody was meeting, you know, anybody there for the first time. So we went and uh, we sat across the table from, from a very cool couple. I mean, I, I really enjoy this couple uh, and, they're, and they're very cool people. But, you know, at that event, the the uh, wife basically said something like, yeah, you know, our friends make no sense to us because, you know, they're driving around. And then she, she proceeded to name the three brands that we are driving in, right? They're driving around in their Audi, their Acura and their Lexus. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's our three cars. So immediately my <laughs> wife went from being like trying to be open to being like, oh my God, like these are not my people because of that comment. Yep. So yeah, the context matters a lot. And that was, uh, yeah, a little bit disconcerting for her as like one of the first conversations we were having. But to, to more broadly answer your question, Carl, yeah, I think it's okay to spend on things that, that you enjoy. You know, it's funny, on one hand, as much as I love my, my Lexus convertible and as much, as much as I love my, uh, my Audi SQ5, on one hand, I can say to myself, I can tell myself a story where it makes no sense to have those cars. I shouldn't have those cars. I should have like a, a practical you know, a uh, daily driver that's much less costly and more efficient. And then on the other hand, it's like when I'm driving those cars and, and having fun, it's like, well, why would I do that? You know, these cars bring me joy. And, uh, you know, being at the economy event, you know, I, I was talking to BJ and he was telling me about how, you know, he's got this RSQ8. And I'm like, dude, that is my dream car. Like you have the RSQ8. I love that thing. That's like, uh, you know, bigger better ass version of my SQ five. And, uh, and he's like, Oh yeah, do you, you want to see it? And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to see it. And I figure he's going to like pull out his phone 
and like start showing me pictures of his RSQ8. He's like, all right, come on out. I've got it in the, in the parking garage. <laughs> and I was like, holy cow, you have it here? So he actually drove to Economy in his RSQ8. And, uh, you know, I was, I, it, it blew me away. The car is just, just super cool. It was basically like the, you know, the bigger, badder ass version of what I have. So instead of being like, you know, 350 horse and 350 foot pounds of torque, you know, it's like 600 horse and 600 foot pounds of torque. And it's a larger vehicle and just the exhaust note sounds awesome. It's just really, really cool. So I told my wife when I got home, I'm like, oh, man, you should see like this RSQ8. You know, BJ started it up for me and he was showing me all the, the features and everything. And she's like, my wife, without missing a beat, she's like, well, buy it. Like, how much is it? Go ahead and buy it. And I'm like, well, the, <laughs> the sticker is like 148. BJ got a deal on his certified pre-owned for like 103 or something. She's like, well, if you want to buy it, like buy it. And that's yeah, my wife is super cool. I, I don't think I'll ever buy one, but it's it's funny to think about. And I don't think it's a problem for people in the FI community to spend money uh, on cars if that's something that lights you up and, and that you like. What do you think, Carl? Because I know you just bought a, a new car recently. And what what is your take on the on the whole car situation with the FI community? Yeah, I think about this all the time and not just with cars, but with whatever lights you up. And I guess that might be the key phrase there, if it lights you up, if it's really important to you, if it's a thoughtful purchase, then why not? And the thing with a car too, if you buy this thing and you don't like it, you could just sell it. You're going to lose a little bit of money, but chances are it's not going to affect any of your long-term plans. Who cares if you lose 10000 bucks on the car? You've had the experiment. You don't have to lust after it anymore. So yeah, that's where I'm at, Bob. If something is really meaningful to you, if it really enhances your life, then go for it by all means. That's the whole point of financial independence for happiness and spending for happiness. So you shouldn't hold back on those and you shouldn't be afraid to experiment with spending either because that's the only way you're going to figure out if this thing is really great. If you get that RSQ8, I think you'll like it. You already have experience with the lesser version. But yeah, if you didn't, oh, well, you've had it. You could even drive it for a year and then sell it after that. Yeah, it's and true. And it's like our, our friends at How to Money, Joel and Matt, the craft beer equivalent, which craft beer can get an ex expensive, but not like cars, of course. But I think, you know, when we talked about this before, Bob, my wife had a similar experience as Amy, one of the early five events Luckily, she met Carl, which which was good. But she also met some maybe people that didn't know they were talking to a newer person or someone that was maybe skeptical is a good word. Like, hey, let's see what this what this crew, what this community is like. So it took a little while for Elizabeth to really come around, and I'm, we're still trying to repair, you know, those first couple meetings in 2019. But I mean, she has come around because she's l retiring early. We're having a little party at HQ. So like everything's fine, but it took a little while to, to come around. And one of our next questions that we have on this, uh, which we kind of already talked about, but I want to open it up for you just in case you have more to add. So we've noticed a change in the FI community from frugality to thoughtful spending. Like any other details that you've noticed, maybe going to some of the events, maybe a change in the the vibe from like 2018 to 2024? Yeah, I think there has been an, a bit of an evolution to your point, Doug. I think there maybe earlier on was kind of this focus on the extreme frugality. I guess the early retirement extreme, Jacob Lund Fisker was even predated um, Mr. Money Mustache. And, um, you know, he, I think he, I forget, was it $10,000 a year or $12,000 a year that he lived on? So his focus was just really on on being super, super frugal. And then obviously Pete was more moderate, but still pretty frugal. And then I guess now the, the big thing that I've noticed is everybody talks about this die with zero book, right? And kind of reframing that, you know, there's, hey, there's seasons in, in life. And yeah, it makes sense at some points to, to, you know, save and invest more. And then, you know, almost to Carl's point about like, you know, you're guaranteed to run out of life at some point. And mathematically, knowing the rule of 72, 
you know, barring any major catastrophe, most of us in this community are going to, you know, have way more money, you know, and in our 60s, 70s and 80s, if we, if we make it there, that it makes sense to spend on what you want to spend your money on. And I think the community seems like they have been taking up that message, not only in, uh, you know, folks that have retired early, but also folks that are just like, Hey, we don't have to race to get to Phi as quickly as possible. We can design the life that we want to live today and have happy lives all along the way. And just getting to Phi is just an eventuality. It's just a math problem. You'll be there eventually, but designing your day to day, you know, in a way that you love and that, of course, includes spending money. So why not spend money on the things that you value if it increases your happiness? And I'm glad to see that the community has has moved in that direction, you know, in the last seven years or so. Yeah, super cool. I'm not sure we can build on that. All right. Well, let, let's wrap it up. What does a perfect day look like for you? Ooh, perfect day. Perfect day. It's like the, there's so many ways to have a perfect day. I guess, you know... <laughs> My wife and I spend a lot of time traveling with each other, which is, which is fantastic. You know, I, I'm super blessed that I get to spend when I'm home a couple days a week, maybe three days a week fishing with my dad. And like any of those days when I'm traveling with my wife or fishing with my dad would be a perfect day. I think if I were to have like a, one of the things that I realized um, at this past economy is that I actually need a little bit more self-imposed structure to my weeks and months and years, um, so that it's not like the endless day <laughs> and, uh, I can get more accomplished and have a bit more impact. So I think if I were designing it bit by bit by bit, it would look like something like getting up early, you know, watching the sunrise over the ocean, going on a walk on the beach with my wife, you know, having my coffee, doing something productive, you know, whether that was for myself or, you know, volunteering, I've, I've, uh, started volunteering over the past couple of years and gotten a lot of value from the little bit of volunteer work that I'm doing. For example, this afternoon, I'm giving a talk at the Upper Shores Library here to kind of traditional retirees as the main audience on how to stay safe online. So preventing things like, uh, you know, getting scammed out of your money or, identity theft and those types of things. And that, that makes me feel good about giving to the community. And then, um, you know, spending some time social, like, you know, whether it's just talking to a, a friend on the phone or, you know, getting out and grabbing a beer with somebody and incorporating all those things into, into my day, I think, uh, that's a perfect day. End it with uh, watching the sunset. My wife and I are super blessed. We live at the beach. So we're three blocks from the, from the ocean and we're like four houses to the bay. So we get to watch tons of sunrises and sunsets and that helps us kind of bookend our days. And uh, yeah, I think, I think that's it. What about you guys? What's a perfect day for, for Doug and Carl? I'll, uh, hold on. I have a couple follow-ups. Uh, All right. A couple, couple quick ones. One, have you seen the green flash? Have not seen the green flash. Still looking for it. Have you seen it? Yeah. I have a very short video of it. We're in, uh, we're on Grand Cayman, the the big island down there. And we saw it like two days in a row. And I was like, I read about it for years. I was like, holy fucking shit. And I had just gotten a camera and um, yeah, I was videoing it. And I was like, did you guys see that? And then sure enough, it was like, like I said, two days in a row. Absolutely amazing. And then the other question, which might be a, a little bit, it could be a whole other show. A lot of people that retire, especially younger, they'll work or sorry, they'll stop working for like a couple months or so and they get the, the itch. They end up going back to work and they, they work part time or whatever. It sounds like you haven't had that issue. I and mean, I'm going to describe it as an issue because I, <laughs> I don't like it when people go back to work, but is there anything that you're doing in your day that you think is keeping you from like pulling you back into work? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think, um, I was so burnt out when I first left that, and I used to work in the, in technology. So I pretty much didn't want to have anything to do with a computer or any kind of screens when I first left. And for the first year, I think, um, I would only fire up the computer once a month just to update our net worth spreadsheet and then shut it back <laughs> down. Like that was it. I, I wasn't doing it at all. 
I have felt the pull to, you know, to use my, my IT skills, I guess, more recently over the past couple of years. And one, you know, really good fit there has been this organization here in Ocean County, New Jersey. It's called Coastal Volunteers in Medicine. And basically it's an organization that helps provide free healthcare services for people that are at 200% of the poverty level and below. So mostly what that ends up meaning is like a lot of undocumented immigrants. And it's cool because they only have two paid positions, the director and the and like the intake person, but all the doctors and nurses are all volunteer. And so I'm basically now their volunteer tech person. So I basically, uh, yeah, I've been able to kind of leverage and use my skills, but in a way that, uh, you know, I'm not getting paid, but it's very meaningful because, you know, I know it's, it's helping a lot of people. And, um, so I get to kind of scratch the itch of doing what I'm good at, but also in a way that's really helpful to, to others. Got it. And I'll let Carl do his his perfect day here really quick. And I, I bet I'll agree with most of what he says yeah. <laughs> for my perfect day. But we don't do it together. But. <laughs> no, that would be an imperfect day, I think, if we were together too much. Uh, yeah, I, th- I was thinking about this when you asked. And uh, there's certain things I need in every day to make it perfect. I, I would say I need a workout, so I need to exercise somehow. I need to do actual work like writing, uh, working on this podcast, working on our book. I need to take a long walk. I try to go for 20, 25,000 steps every day. I, I like to read. I want to have a great conversation with someone, my kids, my wife, maybe a social event at our co-working space, and our kids not trying to kill each other. So all those six things make a perfect day for me. Yep, I agree. That's pretty much my perfect day too. I'll add one layer on top. Like we we do like to travel. So like the novelty and this, again, Bob will have you on again, but like there's something great about the routine and the day you described. But if you do that every single day, everything blends together. Like you said, the endless day, the endless perfect day, right? You can't complain much about that. But then when you go to a new place that you haven't been to before, there's all these new novel things that you can do. And that's a great sort of distraction, which is why probably like all three of us enjoy traveling quite a bit and why most people, when they're like, when I have more free time, I will travel. Yeah. So, all right. Well, Bob, this has been really amazing. Uh, we could talk for hours and we, we literally have before, but where, where can people find you? Yeah. Great hanging out with you guys. Thanks for having me on. I am on Instagram at RJ Haynes and you can find me on Facebook as well. Bob Haynes. And love to connect with anybody that's, you know, has questions about the other side once you've retired early and, you know, what life can look like afterwards. So feel free to reach out. All right. Thanks, Bob. And we'll link up to that so people could find it really easily. And yeah, we'll talk to you soon, buddy. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Cool. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for listening to the show. That was the Mile High Five podcast. And I'm Doug Cunnington the balder host and carl jensen is the cool sexy one if you dig the show please do three things for us number one tell a friend a family member an enemy about the show we really don't care who you tell maybe forward them a specific show that you know that they will like it's the single most helpful thing that you can do to spread the word it's like giving us a virtual high five and uh, actually we don't give high fives in in person so the virtual kind is pretty good and more importantly your friend or family member or even your enemy will appreciate the fact that you were thinking of them number two make sure you're following or subscribed on your podcast app apple podcast spotify overcast youtube whatever you're using and that way you won't miss a show and number three please leave us a rating and review we read them on the show occasionally and you might hear yours out there on an upcoming episode quick disclaimer this show is not financial or legal advice i'd actually be surprised if it sounded like it it's really just for entertainment and that's at least what we're hoping for but seriously get advice from professionals carl and i are just two guys with microphones that sit in my basement and talk so we'll catch y'all next week So, Bob, the three of us just got back from Economy in Cincinnati, which is this big conference where there's like 500 people. There's TED Talk style talks, all these meetups and a bunch of fun things happening. 
Uh, Bob, we'll start with you first. What was your favorite part of economy? My favorite part of economy? It's a tough question. There's a lot of uh, cool parts about economy. I think the, the thing that most stands out to me is you and Doug throwing the kickoff party or the unofficial kickoff party on Thursday night. And uh, for the first time, I've, I see these electric scooters in places that Amy and I travel to, but I've never tried them. I typically want to try them, but I don't. And uh, at Mark Troutman's kind of idea, myself and Stephen and Becky and Mark jumped on the, the Lime scooters and scooted the, I think it was about 1.7 miles to the brewing company, to your party. And uh, that was just a great way to kind of kick it off. It's like, I'm doing something new with, uh, you know, some new friends. I mean, I met them last year, but spent some more time with them this year. And then coming to your kickoff party was just, yeah, it was a great way to kick off the weekend. It's a highlight for me. Super cool. How about you, Doug? It's hard to pick. I, I mean, we talk about it a ton over the the actual event, but it's the community. So it's like, seeing old friends that I've met a couple of years ago, like catch it up with you, Bob. I think the last time we saw each other was economy the previous year and then meeting a bunch of new people. The cool thing this year, maybe more so than others, there were even more new people that never attended events before at all. Like maybe they were lurking in the shadows for five or 10 or 20 years in the fire community. And then they finally came to economy and there were a bunch that came out to the opening party and they're deer in headlights, right? They're just like, Oh my God, there's, there were, I don't know, 150, 200 people. The place was absolutely packed and they didn't know anyone. And they're just like, Oh, what's going on? And they see, they see people they recognize from podcast or YouTube or whatever. And then everyone's just mingling around. So the people, the people. Super cool. That was so fun. There was the one lady, Allison, who we met who I think she told me she had been following this stuff for years, but she had hesitated on going to any events for years because she didn't know how the people would be. And then like two nights later, she's on stage with Brad from Choose Fi and uh, Jordan from Earn and Invest podcast, like yapping about financial independence in her yeah. life. So yeah. How cool is that? Yeah, really, really amazing. And I think I saw right when she walked in and she's one of the ones with like deer and headlights. And I was like, hey, how's it going? And yeah, just from there, I think she talked to Jordan and like you said, ended up on stage on on the main stage with like 500 people for the live podcast recording. So well, what about you, Carl? Well, I had an interesting experience. I was standing there waiting for the talks to start. I think it was it was Saturday or Sunday. I think it might have been. It was Saturday. And this guy named Sam comes up to me and goes, hey, I, I came to Economy to meet you. I'm like, oh, you mean you came, f you, you came for the talks and you just happened to see me? He's like, no, I came specifically to meet you. I'm like, oh, okay. What's this all about? He's like, yeah, I've been following you for, for 10 years now and blah, blah, blah. You changed my life. And these things always give me a little anxiety because I think I'm a pretty boring ass person and uh They'll be like, wow, you've been following me for 10 years. I'm like, number one, I think you should have been doing something more productive with your time. I'm just kidding. I'm uh, trying to put myself <laughs> down here. But uh, you don't want to disappoint people like that. Like there's the... Um, don't mean you heroes. I, I don't want to go there because hero <laughs> seems like too strong of a word. But I hope, Sam, <laughs> if you're listening, I don't know if you are, Sam, but if you're listening, I hope I didn't disappoint because you don't want to build someone up in your head. I... So there was a time when I met someone at FinCon and uh, it was my first FinCon ever. And I'd been following this guy for a long time. And he was the biggest asshole to me. Uh, it was unbelievable. It's the only time that's ever happened. The first person I ever talked to at a financial conference or anything like that. And he was just a jerk. But most people in this community are, are really good. So Sam, if you're out there, I hope I didn't disappoint. And I hope your economy was a good one. And I hope to see you again in the future. That's cool. Yeah, I think I saw you sitting with Sam and he, he looks happy. So I think I think it worked out. I hope so. I, I bought him beer to try to ease the uh to ease my anxiety. <laughs> no one says stuff like, Oh, I thought you'd be taller or oh, I thought your voice would be different or something like that. So it's like a little dig. Well, so who was the person that you met that was an asshole? No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> 